All right, our next speaker is Vlad Kolchinsky, who's going to be talking about low rank um, oh, estimation of smooth kernels on weighted graphs. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm very pleased to be at this meeting, never been uh, at this one before. So uh, I will be talking about uh, a joint work with uh, Pedro Rangel, who is my PhD student at Georgia Tech. And uh, it will be about uh, uh, estimation of uh, kernels defined on a large weighted graph. And uh, it will be done under the assumption that the kernel is on the one hand of small rank, and on the other hand, it has some smoothness uh, on the graph. So uh, to motivate uh, the problem, you can think about usual uh, matrix completion, for instance, uh, think, uh, think of uh, Netflix problem in which the, the target matrix represents uh, uh, rankings, okay? It can be maybe noisy rankings of some uh, items by users of a recommender system. And uh, you, you, you observe just a sample of entries, and you have to recover the no, sa sa sample of noisy entries, and you have to recover the matrix based on this data. And uh, uh, imagine that uh, in addition to the matrix itself, you, say you, you have some uh, other information available to you. For instance, you have some access to profiles of users. And you have uh, some uh, access to profiles of items, right? And this allows you to measure similarities between users and similarities between items. So you are getting a, a structure of weighted graph on the set of users and a structure of weighted graph on the set of items. In such situations, it might be natural, in addition to usual assumptions that the target matrix is low rank, to assume that if uh, users are similar, then their rankings are going to be also correlated, right? And if items are similar, then the rankings by a particular user also will correlate, okay, for similar items. And you are, you are getting some smoothness of the target matrix as a result, okay? Uh, so let me uh, state this problem mathematically, and I will do it only in the case when uh, the, uh, the matrix is symmetric. So we have just one set with, uh, eventually it will be, a set with a structure of weighted graph, right? Not two sets, because it is well known that uh, the, the case of rectangular matrices can be reduced to symmetric case by simple tricks. So it's enough to consider just the case of symmetric matrices. So in this context, I will have a set V. Later, it will be a set of vertices of a graph of uh, cardinality M. And then what I am able to do, I am able to sample couples of points from this set. So X and X prime are randomly picked point from this set. I always assume that I uh, sample these points from a uniform distribution. Okay? And then uh, I, I, I can measure for each such couple a response variable Y, which will be in a bounded range. Okay? It will be always bounded by a number A. And uh, then uh, we can produce data by, uh, by collecting uh, in independent, uh, identically distributed triples like this, right? You have n uh, data points, right? Each data point is a triple like this. And uh, your goal is to estimate the regression function in this case, so conditional expectation of y given the location of two points, right? So y becomes sort of a noisy measurement of this uh, regression function. Okay, so now uh, let me remind you just several, uh, several facts that are very well known in usual low rank matrix recovery before uh, turning to the problems when there is a graph structure in addition. To this. Uh, so, uh, uh, first, uh, you, you know, we can uh, look at noiseless case, right? In the noiseless case, when we uh, just, uh, you know, the entries that we see, we know them precisely. Uh, the, the method that is uh, most popular is the method based on the minimization of the nuclear norm, right, over the set of matrices that, that fit the, di the data perfectly well, right? This is uh, a very well-known method, and uh, it has been studied a lot uh, theoretically in the recent years. 
And uh, what uh, one has to understand is that, uh, of course, there are, there are matrices that, that, that would be impossible to recover at all, right, with, uh, unless you observe almost all entries of this matrix, right? Because if your matrix is very sparse, right, if your matrix is very sparse, for instance, has just, just a couple of uh, non-zero entries, then uh, the probability that you will miss this entry will be overwhelmingly high unless you collect uh, the amount of data which is comparable with the size of the matrix, right? So uh, in order to sort of rule out such obstructions for low rank recovery, people developed uh, the notion of low coherence. So your matrix should be in some sense generic, right? And this is not very sparse, say, and this is characterized by, by so-called low coherence constant, right? And uh, uh, the, the kind of very deep result by Candace and Tower a later, a little bit later, proved in a different way, in a little bit simpler way by Gross, uh, and also, you know, sort of generalized and refined a little bit by Gross. Uh, it, it tells that essentially if uh, this uh, coherence constant, right, if your matrix is generic, if this coherence constant is bounded, then roughly up to a logarithmic factor, it's enough to have, uh, uh, to, to observe the number of entries that is uh, proportional to the rank of the matrix times uh, the size of the matrix, so R times M, which is uh, the, the number of, the param of parameters that characterizes uh, the class of matrices of ranks R, right? So it's a kind of a natural, uh, uh, number of observations you need in order to recover, and with this number of observations you can recover the matrix precisely with, uh, exactly with, uh, with a high probability, right, with a high probability. Now, in the uh, noisy case, if we turn to the noisy case, in this case uh, we uh, uh, kind of uh, are trying to achieve trade-off between uh, fitting the data, right, and minimizing the nuclear norm, which leads to the matrix version of Lasso, so it's kind of least square method with nuclear norm penalty, right? And this method was uh, also has, has been studied a lot and kind of a natural way to measure the error of such estimation procedure is to, you, to look at the L2 norm with respect to the design distribution, which will be just the average square of the entries of the matrix, right? And then if you, uh, there have been lots of work in this, you know, there are various refinements of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the error bounds in this case, and uh, this is relatively recent error bounds. It's kind of very clean in the sense that the, uh, the size of the error in this case is controlled by some of two terms. One term is just approximation error. You don't have to assume that your target matrix is of small rank, and the approximation error comes in the, into this bound with constant one, which is nice. And another term is proportional to the rank of the matrix, right? It's proportional to the rank of the matrix. Such type of bounds are called low rank oracle inequalities. And if you, uh, if you uh, choose regularization parameter epsilon in a standard way, then uh, you will get a bound which is up to logarithmic factors of the order m times r divided by n, right? So m times r is sort of the number of degrees of freedom in this problem, and you are dividing by the sample sizes gives you the size of the error. Uh, okay, uh, it is uh, also known that this type of bounds are, uh, are uh, sharp in minimax sense up to logarithmic factors. So there are, one can prove uh, kind of information theoretic lower bound in this problem that tells that, uh, that uh, this rate of recovery is sharp, right? This rate of recovery is sharp, okay. Now I will start looking at the, uh, at the case when uh, uh, I have indeed a set of vertices of a graph and uh, I have a weight matrix, right? A weight matrix defined on uh, this set of matrices. And what a weight matrix allows me to do, it allows me to consider Laplacian on the graph, right? Laplacian on this weighted graph. It's kind of standard definition of Laplacian. And Laplacian uh, gives me a possibility to look at discrete Sobolev norms in this case. So I have some characterization of smoothness of functions defined on the vertices of the graph. And more importantly for me also of kernels defined on the graph. So the uh, kind of uh, discrete Sobolev norm of the kernel would be in this case just just a weighted sum of the, uh, of the squared Sobolev norms of the eigenfunctions of the kernel, right? Will be equal to this. And uh, uh, it, it is possible to study this problem in the whole scale of Sobolev uh, spaces for different values of P and kind of 
shows that you can come up with some adaptive procedures over the whole uh, scale of uh, different, way, uh, different degrees of smoothness, say. But it will be convenient uh, for my purposes today to fix P. I will fix P and I will denote delta to the power P as W and this will be my operator that defines smoothness in this problem, right? So I, I will uh, have to use notations for the spectrum of this uh, matrix, so there will be kind of uh, increasing sequence of eigenvalues, right, uh, that, uh, that grows not faster than geometric progression. This is the assumption that I have. And then uh, the problem becomes like this, okay? We have the same data as before. We have a matrix completion problem, but now you have two complexity parameters, right, instead of one. Uh, we, we have rank, we had rank before, but on the top of it we have Sobolev norm of the target that, that determines the degree of smoothness of the target. And the question is how well you can do in this situation, right? How the, the minimax lower bounds are going to change and uh, which methods allow you to, to attain this minimax rate, right? Uh, so this is uh, the problem that I will be looking at. So the rate will depend now on two parameters, on R and rho, the radius of the Sobolev ball to which, uh, sorry? You had a constant for the decay of the eigenvalues. Yeah, well, well, no, I don't have the constant. I, I have the constant for the growth of the eigenvalues. I'm not, I'm not allowing eigenvalues to grow faster than, uh, than, than geometry. For me, just a fixed number this, in this, at this point. Uh, okay, so it's very easy to understand uh, heuristically, at heuristic level, what the rate should be in this type of problems, and this is what I will try to explain you. So uh, the fact that uh, the target kernel is smooth, has some smoothness that is controlled by this radius of Sobolev ball, allows you to approximate uh, the target kernel if you represent it in, in, the, in the basis of eigenfunctions of Laplacian, right? You can approximate uh, the target kernel by essentially in this basis L times L matrices for L smaller than the overall size of the matrix that you observe. And the uh, accuracy of this approximation will be controlled by the Sobolev norm and will be controlled by how fast the eigenvalues grow, right? So we have this, this type of bound. Then if, if you are looking at L times L matrix, right? If you are looking at L times L matrix, you can hope, it's a little bit of wishful thinking here, that, uh, that you can estimate uh, this uh, matrix with the rate which will be, uh, um, which will depend on the rank, and the rank now for this matrix is the minimum of R and L, right? So we have the product of the minimum of R and L, L is the size of this matrix, right, and divided by the sample size. This will be the rate, right? This is wishful thinking because we do not observe this matrix directly. We observe our matrix represented in the canonical basis, so the data is different, right? So, but if the world is a fair place, then this is what you should get, okay, say. And then uh, you have uh, approximation error and estimation error for any fixed L. So you have to achieve trade-off between uh, approximation error and estimation error, right? You have to take sum or maximum. I don't care because I don't care about constants here. I'm taking maximum between estimation error and approximation error. And then I have to minimize this with respect to L. And this uh, should be the, the error rate in this problem. And... Uh, 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 and uh, it's very easy to see that under the assumption on the eigenvalues I imposed, this uh, mean max expression, it will be of the same order as max mean expression, okay? This is important for me because uh, I will, uh, will be showing you gradually that, uh, that this mean max expression will appear in the upper bounds and max mean expression will appear in the lower bounds, but they are of the same order. Okay, now uh, th this is sort of a heuristic. Now I will turn to what actually we were able to prove in this case. And we'll start with lower bounds. So it's kind of a, a result that has information theoretic flavor. Uh, so you're considering this, the set of all distributions of the data, the set of all distributions of the data such that uh, the target matrix is uh, rank not more than R, and has a uh, Sobolev norm that is bounded by rho. Okay, this is your class. And then I, I also will, uh, this, this uh, constant QP, which characterizes the, the, the size of the LP norms of the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, right, would play some role for me with P kind of large, maybe of the order like logarithm of M would be enough for me. 
Okay, and then uh, uh, if you look at this expression on the top, right, it's almost what, uh, what uh, was needed, right, almost what was needed, but there is a spoiler, there is a sort term here in this minimum, right, that, uh, 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 that, that we know at this point that some term of, uh, of this kind is needed, but we don't know precise form of this term, right? We, 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 this is the, the form which we were able to show, right? And uh, this uh, uh, term does not hurt a lot if n is sufficiently large. If n is above some threshold, then there is no impact of this term, and we are getting uh, the, this heuristic rate that I that I uh, told you before, but uh, at the moment we have uh, additional term in this bound. And, uh, but, 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 but with this additional term, the bound can be proved, right? The bound can be proved. Uh, and now if you look at uh, a, a, very, uh, a, a very typical case, a very typical case when the spectrum, uh, the spectrum grows as k to the power twice beta, so we kind of mimic the situation of, you know, kind of uh, classical Laplacians and classical Sobolev spaces, say, right? Uh, uh, then in this case, when n is above some threshold, when n is above some threshold, the rate can be computed uh, precisely what it is, and it will be given by this, by this seemingly intimidating expression, but I will try to convince you that this is this is w very meaningful statistically, okay, what, uh, what, what this expression tells you. Uh, in order to understand what this expression means, imagine first, okay, that, uh, uh, that rho tends to infinity. So, in fact, uh, there is no smoothness at all in this problem, right? Rho is very large. Then, uh, first two terms in this uh, minimum, well, there are three terms, right, would disappear, right? And we are left with the error rate that, uh, th th that we know is more or less correct error rate in matrix completion problem, right? So this is what, what should happen, right, in a matrix completion problem. On the other hand, imagine, okay, that rho is uh, bounded, right? Rho is bounded, but m tends to infinity. So then the last term disappears from the bound, right? The last term, uh, the, the, the last uh, term in the minimum disappears from the bound, and we are left with the minimum of the first two terms, right? Imagine that rank is small. For, for simplicity, assume that rank is equal to one. In this case, uh, well, uh, when, when M already, when we let M go to infinity, basically the problem of estimation of the matrix in the limit becomes the problem of estimation. You can view it as the problem of estimation of a continuous kernel, right? You're kind of in, in the realm of non-parametric statistics now, right? You're sort of trying to estimate a continuous kernel, right, in the limit. And then, uh, if now we assume that this is a kernel of small rank, for instance, rank is equal to one, the problem boils down to estimation just of one function, right? You need to estimate one eigenfunction of the kernel, and you know the kernel, right? And if you uh, check, uh, you know, if you remember uh, cl classical rates in non-parametric statistics, if you want to estimate, if, if you want to estimate function of smoothness beta that lives in Sobolev ball that corresponds to some smoothness beta, right? And uh, uh, and uh, you are doing non-parametric estimation of this function. The first term will be precisely the error rate in this problem. You know, everything is correct. The dependence on n, the dependence on rho, uh, the dependence on on A, which is noise parameter, this is precisely the rate in, in, in the problem of non-parametric estimation of one function. Now imagine that R tends to infinity, right? If R tends to infinity, so it's not a low rank problem at all, then we are left with the term in the middle, right? We are left with the term in the middle, and the term in the middle will be uh, exactly the, the error rate in the problem of estimation of function of two variables of smoothness beta. Right? In this case, we lost information of low rank structure of the problem, and we are left just with, with the basic problem of estimation of a smooth function you know, of two variables. Right? And this gives you the rate. So there are several problems packed in this problem. Usual matrix completion problem, problem of estimation of, of continuous kernel of small rank, right? and problem of estimation just of continuous kernel without rank assumption. And uh, there are some, uh, depending on the, uh, on the values of the parameters, of the complexity parameter, of rank, of rho, and so on, there are uh, sort of phase transitions between different problems and between different convergence rates here, okay? And, and this is represented in this expression. Now, the last uh, question that I want to discuss very briefly is how to achieve, which methods allow you to achieve this rate, right? For which methods the rates are attained. And uh, we studied a couple of approaches. One approach is uh, completely uh, unpractical. Yeah, I know, I'm finishing, yeah. 
One approach is completely unpractical. Uh, it is based on a version of least square methods when you kind of uh, uh, looking at a bunch of least square estimators uh, in classes of matrices of different uh, rank, right? Of different rank, you are fixing the rank for each class, right? And then you, you are fixing the size of the matrix. The matrix is represented in, in the basis of eigenfunctions of Laplacian, right? You are fixing the size, and you are sort of uh, solving a bunch of least square problems, and you are adding complexity panels on the top of it, right? And then uh, it, it, it can be proved in this case that uh, the rate will be up to logarithmic factor what is needed, right? What, what it, it will be the expression that we, we wanted, actually, heuristically, but there is a logarithmic factor present here. And if you look at this sort of canonical example for me when the spectrum, of, well, the spectrum uh, grows as uh, k to the power twice beta, you can compare this with the lower bound, it will be the same expression, but there are some logarithm, uh, added, logarithm logarithmic factors that are now present in the bound. Now, uh, th th this uh, method is based on, uh, you know, completely non-convex optimization problem, non-convex, non-smooth, non-anything. So it's not uh, really a method that can be implemented. A more practical method would be to use least squares with uh, double penalization. One penalty is the one that is usually used in low rank recovery, it's nuclear norm penalty. And another one is, is based directly on the Sobolev norms that we need here in order to impose smoothness of the solution. And uh, unfortunately, what is happening in this case is that there are two realization parameters. The first one can be chosen in the standard way, but this parameter epsilon with bar requires some tuning, actually. This can be done, for instance, by some version of what is called aggregation in statistics, by splitting the data into two parts and uh, kind of using one part in order to construct estimators for different values of, uh, of epsilon bar, and then choosing epsilon bar. And you need m values of epsilon bar, so you will, as a result, have to uh, increasing the, co the computational complexity by, by a factor m uh, because of this, right? But it's still, uh, you know, based on convex optimization problem. In this case, I, I'm not going to show you in detail what kind of results can be proved. Let me just uh, get to the last slide. Basically, what is happening in this case is that you uh, can attain the lower bound, but not only up to logarithmic factor, as in the previous case, but also up to some low coherence constant. There is a low, uh, surprisingly, there is a low coherence parameter involved in this bound, and this is low coherence uh, not in the sense uh, in which this parameter is used in, uh, in noiseless matrix completion. It's low coherence uh, with respect to the, uh, with respect, not in canonical basis in which we observe the matrix, but with respect to the basis of eigenfunctions of Laplacian. It's a different low coherence condition. The same type of condition, but different uh, basis, right, is used to define this constant. But uh, if your matrix is, uh, possess this low coherence property with respect to the, the basis of uh, of eigenfunctions of Laplace, and then uh, we have this bound. It's, uh, it's a little surprising because it's not in the nature of the problem here. You saw that, uh, that uh, you can achieve, uh, achieve minimax bound without this if you use uh, non-convex method, right? The method with non-convex penalization. It's in the nature of the method. It's uh, kind of the result of interplay interplay of two penalties that are used here, and I, at the moment, we don't know whether, whether it can be avoided in some other convex optimization procedure. Uh, thank you. If, if you are adding extra penalty, yes. well, you know there are there are clearly cases when you when you when uh, my my student did a number of experiments with this right, and there are clearly cases that when 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 you sort of see that your 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 target is smooth, right? Uh, there is an advantage in in adding this extra penalty, and uh, kind of you can you, you can show experimentally that that that, that using non-zero extra regularization parameter helps in this case, right? You you, you are improving recovery, of course. It's uh, it's not surprising. It should be 
should be this way if your, 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 your target matrix is, uh, is kind of smooth. Of course, in many, in many situations, you don't really know whether it's smooth or not, right? But uh, in many cases, it probably will be, would be smooth, and then some, some, some technique like this can be helpful. So when you have that smoothness, can you relax the uniform sampling assumption? Oh, yes. Uh, uniform sampling assumption is, is uh, basically to avoid, uh, in this case, just to avoid very, very nasty uh, and more technical formulations you know, of the results, but it's possible to not to use uniform sampling. You can, you can sample from, uh, from, uh, from whatever design distribution you want, uh, under some constraints, of course. Um, I think in some real applications, the, there's correlations in the uh. sample. Uh -huh. like I might watch very similar uh -huh. movies to what someone else watches. So uh -huh. it's just in the sampling. Well, you mean you mean the, 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 the sampling is not even IID, right? Well, yeah, sure. But uh, in order to develop this theory, we are probably um, probably would, would make our life miserable if we <laughs> start uh, looking at non-IID sampling. In this case, it would, uh, would be too, too messy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, there is. Uh, you, you are absolutely right. There is some contradiction. Okay, between uh, between uh, there, there is some trade-off. Okay, between between uh, between smoothness. You cannot have it at the same time very smooth and and very and and, 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 and very, very small coherence. Okay, so this this constant new matters. Okay, and it bothers us a lot. But but it seemed to be seemed to be inevitable. Uh, um, if you start analyzing uh, these two penalties, it seems to be inevitable. Okay, just just ju just occurs very naturally. But uh, but uh, that's why I am telling you that it's a, a, an open question as whether there is another method of recovery that is based on some convex. Uh, uh, that you can pose as, say, as convex optimization, right? But such that this would not lead to to, to the slow coherence constant in, in this bulb. Okay. Looks like slide again, please. 